Well, good morning. Sister Mason, come on up and we'll get started here. Everybody doing well today? Hope so. I already got, gotten several uh, prayer requests and picked up on a few uh, prayers of things so far this morning. Um, starting with some of the requests, um, Carolyn Perigo, she is home recovering. Uh, Jim Estes is back with us, still recovering, and we're thankful for uh, successful surgeries on uh, on them. Uh, been asked to remember Brother Ben Roberts. He's going to see the doctor this week on uh, some vision issues he's having. Uh, and Sister Maggie Hester, she is hoping to uh, get out of the ICU and into a room soon. Uh, she went through about 15 hours of surgery, and uh, all accounts saying that uh, she's kind of ahead of schedule right now on her recovery, so we're thankful for, uh, for that. Uh, on a side note, if anybody would like an address to send her a card, our, our sister Patrilla has that address, so you can see her and she'll, she'll get that to you. Um, other prayers of thanks, I know we've got a, uh, a new asset here at the church with the, with a new bus out front, and we're thankful for uh, the opportunities that that will allow us to, to reach out into our community. If you haven't seen it, going, going out there and take a, take a walk through through it. Uh, we've got a uh, uh, Matthew Hall. He's not in our class today. He's in the little chapel. If you get an opportunity, meet him today. Uh, he's a recent convert through the jail ministry, and we're always thankful whenever uh, uh, they join us once they're able. And I know Sister, G Sister Googe is uh, extremely happy having her family here with her. And she may not verbalize it in a class, but I know she's excited to have our whole family there uh, beside her, taking up a whole pew. That's always a blessing. Any other prayer requests or? Uh, Kate Westfield, Evelyn's daughter is not doing well with her cancer. Tell me, the, tell me the name again. Kay, Kay Brassfield. Kay Brassfield. It's Kayla's mother, Kayla Farr's mother. Kayla Farr's mother. I mean, that's who that is. Oh, okay. Johnny Mathis. Johnny Mathis. Yep. Jerry, Jeremy, I think. Large Griffin fan. I think they carry the horse to the ER. Maybe Wednesday night or something like that. At least one of them. Uh, and she can give you more information on it than I can because I just heard it. Okay. Remember uh, the Roger Griffin family, Dolores, ended up going to the ER sometime this week, so we need to remember they I'm not exactly sure everything's going on. She had to come home with her, her blood pressure. Oh. She came home Thursday with low pressure. Uh, blood pressure not good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Chris and Sue. I'm not the greatest with names, so when somebody else says it, I have a hard time questioning it. So. And I heard when he got to that hospital, they had him sitting up on the side of the bed, which was very good. That's good. I think uh, he's shown a lot of improvement since uh, his initial uh, admission, and so hopefully that will continue going. It's still a long road that he's going to have. What about Chuck Bonham? Chuck Bonham? Um, He's, he's still having a lot of pain from the procedure, but um, it was one long day. Um, they had us be there at 7.30, and they didn't take him back until 1 o'clock in the afternoon, and we didn't leave the hospital until like 8.30 in the evening. Mm -hmm. And um, um, the where you have just what you yeah, They said um, we were hoping to have the results of the MRI, <clears throat> and it was so late in the evening by the time we got out of there. And they finished with it, they couldn't read it. 
and they said we could find the results off Friday, but that his doctor had left on a plane that so evening to go to a conference. And still, still waiting on information. We're still waiting. The waiting is the hardest part. Tonight we're going to be opening our doors to uh, the Northeast community. We're going to fill up this auditorium with, with visitors, so make sure you're here. Make sure you uh, take every opportunity to welcome them, and uh, we don't get this opportunity very often. Uh, so we want to uh, pray for Brother Aaron as he leads our thoughts tonight, and uh, as we have all those visitors with us here at the Northeast. And bring a lot of food. <laughs> Sorry, that was the most important thing. Bring a lot of food. You got football players, they get hungry this time. Prayers Thanksgiving. Randy Morris having surgery next week. You need to remember Randy Moore, he's gonna be having surgery next week. As always, I thank, thank the Lord for all of our blessings, for answering our prayers, and for our church. Mm -hmm. A lot of successful surgery this week. Yeah, a lot of successful surgery. Thanks, and my uh, daughter and her husband got home safely. Robert's daughter and husband made it home. If no one else will go to our Father in prayer, would you bow with me? Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to be with friends and to be with family and we with brothers and sisters and come together with the purpose of, of opening up Your Word, Father, to, to continue to improve our knowledge, to continue to strengthen our love and our devotion to You, Father. And we pray that we will use this time to, to focus on that and that we will be able to turn our attention to, to You in the coming hour, Father. Father God, we know that You are in control, that You are Almighty, that you are able to do all things, Father. And we want to lift up names to you, Father, that are going through recoveries or that may have upcoming surgeries, that have experienced losses or just have some unknown questions right now, Father, and they're seeking answers. And we pray that, that you will be with them as they go through these, these events in their lives. And we pray that you will give them the comfort that they need, the healing that they need, and the support that they need. We lift up to you Carolyn Perigo, Jim Estes, Ben Roberts, Maggie Hester, Kay Brassfield, Ellison Wade, Donna, Donnie Mathis, uh, Roger Griffin, his family, and, and those that have been uh, in Do uh, Dolores, Sue Glenn and Craig Glenn, Chuck Bonham, and Randy Moore. Father God, we are thankful for opportunities where we get to open up our doors and where we have new faces and new opportunities that arise and a new school year will provide that, Father, and we pray that you will bless us tonight as we uh, receive so many that are a part of the Northeast community, Father, the students as well as the faculty, and we pray that you will make those, uh, those opportunities fruitful, that we can Show your love to them through us, Father, and we pray that they may be touched and may wish to continue to worship with us as they have a new home here in Boonville for, for the time being. Father God, we're thankful for things that allow us to carry out your word, such as our new uh, bus, bus asset, Father. We're thankful for Maggie Hester's recovery as being ahead of schedule and thankful for all the successful surgeries that have occurred over the past few days. Father God, we're thankful for new brothers and sisters that come and worship with us, and we're thankful for Matthew Hall, and we pray that we will be a strength of support to him and his walk. We're thankful for family that surrounds us, and, and want to thank uh, uh, Sister Gouge's family for being here with us today. 
And Lord God, we're thankful for the blessings and the church that you provide for us, Father, that you answer so many blessings, that you answer so many uh, prayers and provide us with the support that we need. Father God, we're thankful for when those that are that are away from home make it home safely, and we're thankful for the Roberts family, his daughter and, and her husband making it home safely. Lord God, there may be more on our hearts and our minds that we want to lift up to you, and we know that you hear those, those cries out from our hearts, Father. Be with all those that are in need. Father, be with us in this class. Help us to, to open up our minds to, to what you would have us to learn and help us to focus on you, Father. We thank you so much for Jesus Christ, and in his name we pray. Amen. Okay. You said Tricia, Teresa, Sherfield. She'll be worshiping. Another jail ministry convert will be uh, worshiping in Marietta. Gotcha. Thankful for all those that are active in the jail ministry and are fulfilling that calling feeling that need of, of reaching out to those that uh, may have done wrong in their lives, but we're all thankful that God gives us a second chance to, to get right with Him. If you would, uh, we're going to continue our thoughts on, uh, on leadership, and uh, I think we're going to sing number 745 today, uh, Humble Yourself. In the book, it's called Humble Thyself, but we're used to singing it from the, from the screen. It'll be Humble Yourself. So we're going to change that word real quick. Um, we talked last week about being a servant, and we're going to continue that, that same thought. And part of being a servant is being humble. 745. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. has always been known to, to have a song. Sister uh, Juanice Floyd has been one that always said, let's sing a song. Let's sing a song. And so we just always have. People have been willing to accept that request. Leaders have seen 
that there's a blessing or that there's an opportunity. We can work on new songs. We can choose songs that help uh, reinforce the lesson. And so you may not have known that, but any time I'm in here and singing, I always remember my Aunt Juanice because I know that's, that's something that she enjoys doing and something that, that she's enjoyed in here as a part of that. I don't see that they're here today, uh, so we need to continue to remember the Floyds, but uh, um, just something that I just thought about there. If you would, turn to Matthew 18. We're going to continue to see that the disciples struggled with a question. And we touched on it last week, but it was a different context. It was during the Lord's Supper, and we saw the washing of the feet, and we saw how uh, Jesus was a good example. I feel like I'm loud today. Jesus was a good example, and he washed the disciples' feet. And that was spurred on by, or later followed by, who's the greatest? It's not the first time they asked it. We're, we're going to be in Matthew 18, verse 1. It says, And at that time the disciples came to Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Man, they're, they're stuck on, on who's the best. Because that's, that's kind of the way we're, we're geared here in America, too, is we're always trying to find that next step. Who's, who's better? Who's, who's more important? And we've got we to gotta level things out. Verse 2, Jesus called to him a child. He put him in the midst of them and said, Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Verse 4, whoever humbles humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me, and whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin it would be better for them to have a great millstone or fasten around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. That got real serious real quick, didn't it? Got real serious real quick. Like, you got to be like a child. Okay, okay. Now, if you mess up and you call this child to stumble, it's better for you to be thrown in the sea in the sea with a big piece of stone wrapped around your neck so that you go down to the bottom of it. Whew. That gets heavy real quick. Okay. If we, ha- we as parents have a leadership responsibility to make sure that our children are... Uh, where they need to be and that we're giving them the proper Christian education every opportunity and it's not just for church but it's also our example outside of the church it's also our example and our responsibility as individuals turn over to Mark or Luke 9 46 This is again another telling of this story. And it says in verse 46, An argument arose among them as to which was going to be the greatest. This is uh, the, same, the same scene, so, so it's not, a, not an additional one. But Jesus, knowing the reasoning of their hearts, took a child and put him aside and said to him, Whoever receives the child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. For he who is least among you is the one who is great. Luke here didn't bring in the, the negative that, that, or the warnings that Jesus brought in into that, that discussion. But we have to realize that children are an important part of the congregation. We, we can inadvertently, sometimes on purpose, but sometimes we can inadvertently uh, discourage a child. And we've talked numerous times in this class. We've had a whole, 
lesson on edification, on building one another up. Move over to Mark 10, 13 through 15. And they were bringing children to him that he might touch them, and the disciples rebu rebuked them. But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant and said to them, Let the children come to me. Do not hinder them, for such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. How are we supposed to receive the kingdom of God? Like a child. Well, let's, let's talk about that. What, is, what does it mean to be, why, why is he calling us to be childlike or to be like a child here? They're humble and innocent. innocent. Receptive to instruction. Trusting. Any other thoughts? They're loving. I've got written down a child is teachable. A child is willing to learn. A child is empathetic towards others. Whenever they see someone hurting, they want to go and try and take care of them. They're free from prejudices. They don't put somebody in a box as soon as they meet them. They're not self-reliant. Children are completely reliant on God, or on their parents, on, on their teachers, on people to provide. And so we should be childlike so that we are reliant on God in that manner. Just going back to that, that discussion there, that child loves that mother even though that mother may not be treating him the best way, right? Because he'll still cry if you take him away from his mother. There's that unconditional love that they have. And so we're called to be childlike in that. Now, should we have every characteristic of a child? We need to humble ourselves and become like a little child, but there, are there some characteristics of children that we, sh we shouldn't always emulate? We shouldn't always need milk. Hmm? We shouldn't always need milk. I got a two-year-old right now. What do you think he says all the time? Mine! 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 He's got mine! And he and Luke, Caleb and Luke. Whew. So, you know... The Bible says to be childlike, but we don't need to always take it, and we need to use our own reason. We need to use our understanding of where the Bible is coming from and what characteristics of a child, because a child can be selfish sometimes, right? Yeah. They can be immature in their judgment. Why did you do that? I don't know. Ooh. <laughs> they tell it like it is sometimes. We, we need to have the right filter on. They may not have the right intelligence. May, they may not have the, the, the knowledge, the experience. They don't know, not always know good versus evil. But we have the ability to exercise proper judgment. I think he is very easy to forgive. Mm -hmm. For example, uh, you can see two strapping out there, and in 30 minutes they're loving each other's neck. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they, they, they can be at each other and, and on, on level, level 10 on, on getting at each other, and then five minutes later they're happy going down the, down the way. I know many times I've had one of my kids say, well, I'm never going to do such and such with you again. Don't say never. That's a rule in our house. Don't say never and always uh, because those are absolutes that, that don't always work out because shortly thereafter they're playing. They're having a good time. Now, I say all that because in our Christian walk, 
leaders have to, to bring the members from a childlike state where we humble ourselves and we become a child. Let's move over to uh, 1 Corinthians 13. We have to become like a child, but we don't always stay like a child. First Corinthians 13, we'll start in verse 11. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall now know fully, even as I've been known fully. There's a sense of growth. Whenever we're babes in Christ, when we're children, we don't always approach situations the best way. But we grow up, we get experience, we keep striving for higher ground. We keep striving to, to know better. Mm-hmm. Exactly. How long does it take to raise a child? There we go. That was the answer I was looking for. A lifetime. Because how many that still have their parents with them today, do you still turn to them asking for advice? Asking for help? Seeking that leadership? There you go. And so, that doesn't change in our Christian walk. We've got to remember that we, being older and more mature Christians, are responsible. We are called to be leaders. We are called to continue to raise up our brothers and sisters. Now, as uh, Sister Johnson said, that doesn't mean they stay on milk. We don't keep giving them baby food. We keep building upon what they know and we start where they're at and we continue to build on top of it. We provide opportunities for those that are younger because there's things I do for Jack that I don't do for Caleb. Or there's things I do for Caleb that I don't do for Jack because they're at different stages. They're in my household. But they need different things. They need different stimuli. They need different growth opportunities. Because they're at different stages. The same thing happens for everybody in their Christian walk. That's, I'm, I'm, I've got a, uh, a discussion later on in my lesson. I'm going to talk about our, our teaching responsibility and something I learned back in, uh, back in college at a, at a retreat. Uh, flip over to 1 Corinthians 14 and 20. We always seem to gravitate back to 1 Corinthians 14 in this, in, in this study series. It says, Brothers, do not be children in your thinking. Be infants and evil, but in your thinking be mature. We don't always think like a child. A child wants it his way, and he can't always understand why they're told to do something else. Why they're not getting their way. And so we as members, we as leaders, we as brothers and sisters have to be mature in our thinking to know what's appropriate. This is back in the study of tongues and using those tongues in an improper manner. And they said, think about what you're doing for a minute. You're talking in tongues and nobody understands you. How is that building anybody up? For, uh, flip over to Philippians 3. We're seeing here that there's a continued call for growth, for maturity. 1 Corinthians 3, verses 12 through 17. 
Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me His own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way, and if anything, if, and if anything you think otherwise, God revealed that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. We've always got to be looking forward to the, to the ultimate goal. What's that goal? Heaven. Everything we do, everything that we strive to do should be for that purpose. I've talked many times or I've talked before about having purpose. If we don't have that purpose, we don't have anything to measure against. If we don't have anything to measure against, we don't know where we are. And so here we have that goal, we have that goal ahead of us, and that's where we get to. That's where we strive to get to. Flip over to Ephesians 4 and verse 1. It's going to be a long, uh, a long set of passages, four ver- through one through sixteen. I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body, one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call: one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all, but grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Jumping down to verse 11, And He gave, he gave, some to, be, to, he gave to the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the, pre, the shepherds, the teachers, to equip the saints for the ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we attain the unity of the faith, of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes, rather speaking the truth in love. We are to grow up in every way into Him who is the head into Christ, for whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped. When each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Go from children to manhood, building one another up in love so that we can attain the goal. It's a process. And we've got to see that things are a process. Now you go, Jeremy, what has this got to do with worship and leadership? Last week there was a, a question about our youth, and how they lead worship, and whether it was worship. Uh, I may not have handled the answer the proper way. I think I gave the right answer, but emotionally, I, I, I know I didn't answer the right way. And I say that because we, as members, have to realize that we've got to grow our children. We've got to grow them from infants in Christ, babes in Christ. And it's not just our youth, it's also our adult members. We've got to grow them so that they can fully lead, so that they can be constructive members of the Lord's church. Because if we leave them behind, if we treat them like they're two-year-olds their whole life, what are they going to act like when they're adults? Two-year-olds. We always say, well, they're not ready to do something. Well, we all got to try something the first time, right? We've got to love them enough to say, we want to give you an opportunity. Flip over to Matthew 28. Verse 19. 
says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is written to the disciples. But is that not our calling to each and every one of us? To teach? To baptize? Well, I, I, I don't know. That, that's, that's, that's to the disciples, so I may not be able to get... Okay, well, let's look over at 1 Peter 2. Let's go over to 1 Peter 2. Verse 9. It says there, You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for His own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of Him who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. Who's He talking to there? Christians. And Christians are to do what? second part of this, proclaim the excellencies of Him who called you out of darkness and into His marvelous light. We've got to do that. We've got to make that proclamation and when we give the youth the forum, that gives them the opportunity to do that. And we need to be humble in that. We don't need to be a stumbling block for the young people we need to be encouragers building them up. But not just our young people, but for our new converts. For people that are striving to do things for the first time, that they are learning, that are wanting to learn, that are wanting to proclaim, that are wanting to be members and constructive members of this congregation in the Lord's church. But we have to remain humble. Mm -hmm. there is a point where a child has to accept their own faith there's only so long that I'm going to have an opportunity to make sure that Jack and Shannon and Luke and Caleb are here now I'll always have, have the, the influence to help put them on the right path but I've got to lay the foundation now so that whenever they get to make that decision, it's not a decision anymore. It's just their choice. It's their understanding. But it's got to go past the, well, my mom and dad make me do this. It's got to get past that. It's got to be, I want to be here. They've got to come to that maturity. They've got to get past that, that childlike thoughts. And so they, everybody goes through that where they get that little bit of sense of freedom but they don't always make the right decisions. And it may be because we haven't done the proper way of leading them. That we haven't raised them up the proper way. Because all of us here are responsible for the younger generation, right? See, I, I, I'm trying to expand this class past what we do in that 50 square foot of the building and realize that the church is the rest of this building, and the church has this responsibility. We've got a responsibility for our influence on all of our brothers and sisters. We have a great responsibility. That's right. That's right. And 
and so that's where we go back to Matthew, where if we push the children away and cause them to stumble, what does he say it's better or, or might as well have done? Tile a millstone around your neck. Throw him into the sea. So we need to be encouragers to the young ones. We need to be encouragers to those that are young in Christ that may be older. And realize that they're not where we are. But we were there at one point, right? We all have a first time to try something. We have, and and, and the, the, the first topic or the next topic in this lesson was leaders can limit worship. Leaders sure can limit worship. What I'm going to say to that is, is how many hours are we at Sunday school? One hour a week. Is Sunday school enough? What? And that's something that that's hard. I know it's. It, I know there's many here that struggle with a child that's fallen away. I, I, can't, I can't empathize with that at this point in my life. I, I, don't, I don't know that. But I know I've seen the pain in some faces because of that. But I want to go back to one hour a week for Sunday school. Is that enough? No. And so if you think that Sunday school is going to get your child to heaven, it's not enough. You've got to be as a leader to. Re it is a start. I'm not saying that that it's that it's not useful. I, I don't don't misunderstand me there. But it, it's 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 not enough. You know, you can live your life before. Yeah. There's, there's, you know, we, we know about the scattering of seeds. Some are going to accept it, some are not. Some think something else is going to come up and uproot it, you know, and it's just not going to flourish. And, and we've been warned about that. And so we've got to be vigilant in our tending of it. Jim, you held your hand up a moment ago. I, I totally agree with what you're saying about the, the importance of the total foundation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Such as, we're going to make a decision on whether we're going to Sunday school or not. Yeah. Send that signal out to your family, and, and you just undermine all this other stuff where you talked about spirituality being important. Yeah, it's the, it, it goes past that one decision on Sunday morning. It's the decisions every day that we make, the example that we are, the, the, uh, the path that we walk. And so that carries over. That has lasting repercussions. And so... Yeah, we have, to, we have to work on that. We have to work towards that every day that... that that they accept Christ and they accept God as their own and they understand that and it's not just something that we do. You know, kids has got such a such a load on them today that in my growing up didn't have. Mm -hmm. They've got much more that entices them. Peer pressure keep them going and on and on. And they and they come in contact with that every day of their life. We have a whole lot more distractions today than we used to. A whole lot more distractions. And so that is where we as parents, we as leaders, we have to pull those distractions away and say, okay, let's go back and let's focus on what's important and realize what's important. 
in a in a worship setting, I'm gonna I'm gonna change our gears, get us back in the. I'm gonna, I want to get at least one of. Six, 10, 15. When you have a, a worship service, and you've got our leaders up front, who's in who's in control? Who's decided what we're worshiping, what we're saying, what we're praying? Those people, right? And so. We as members, we as congregations, we're at the mercy of what others decide, what they decide. Those people, they set the tone, they set the mood of the worship, they are the ones that say the, the words that, that change our hearts and our minds for communion and prepare for that. But have you ever heard where a leader has blamed the members? Well, the members just weren't with it today. The members just weren't, I just didn't feel like they were, it was the members' fault. Well, as leaders, we have to accept responsibility for the results of what we plan. I'm talking here about whenever I've led a song, it was the wrong song. You know, it just didn't work out. I've got to accept responsibility. It's not entirely your fault. It goes back to the things that we've talked about where we've had children that have stepped away. Where have I failed? What did I not do right? What can I do to help others not make the, the same errors that I may have made? Or what can I do to encourage others to say, this is what's worked for me? Leaders, they develop the service. They got to accept responsibility for the results. There was a man uh, by the name of uh, Batsel Barrett and ba Baxel Barrett Baxter. So that's a tongue twister if I've ever heard one. He said, if the congregation goes to sleep, you've got to wake up the preacher. There's some truth to that, right? There's some truth to that because if you're not if you're not doing your job to keep the membership engaged, it's not on the members, that's on the leaders. And so that extends past the, the person actually physically doing the, the act of worship or the act of leading. It goes and expands to those that are in charge of the service, those that uh, that are selecting who leads, because there may be somebody that says, Look, this is not your skill set. But we want to use you over here. We want, to, we want to redirect your skills. We don't just totally demoralize them. We redirect them to something that they can be more beneficial. I'm not saying that just because they were bad that one time that they should never get an opportun another opportunity. Because we all improve, don't we? You put me in this, in this class 13 years ago whenever I joined. I've been nervous wrecked and you know gone gray a whole lot younger than I already have but we've got to realize where people are and, and continue working, continue building them. We're going to continue our thoughts there. I think we, I, I spent a little longer than I, than I thought it was on the other, but I appreciate your comments. I know there's been some hearts touched today, that, and, and I appreciate you being open with your discussions, and uh, I pray that, that we will accept our roles as leaders in, of the next generation and help them to, to come to a full knowledge of Christ, continue to, to grow from a child and to grow into manhood, not only physically but spiritually. Thank you again for your comments. Thanks, Charlie.